We are continuing this series in Revelation. Again, we're looking at these seven letters in the first, or in chapter two and three of Revelation, and we'll be in chapter three. Um, so if you want to open your Bibles to that, um, verse one is where we'll be at this morning. But all of these letters we've been looking at, and as we've been paying attention, we've maybe realized or, or recognized that things aren't all that different from 2,000 years ago. Uh, that these letters, although written to specific churches, really have a broad appeal. Um, each of these letters would have been read at all seven of the churches. And, uh, and for us, I mean, each one of them ends with this, you know, if you have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, well, we have those ears and we have been hearing what the Spirit says to the churches. Those are very much for us as well. And so we've been looking at how um, really what Jesus has continually done is how are we distinct? How do we stand as this alternative community amongst a dominant culture uh, that maybe views the world a bit different um, than us? And, and this morning, it, it'll be in a similar vein as far as the message that's applicable to us. And we're looking at this church in Sardis. And Sardis, I think, really connects with our world because there's this reputation that preceded Sardis. Um, and one of the things about our world, right, in an um, ever-shrinking world, I call it like a global village, right, the world is smaller than it seems to have ever been, um, with things like social media and all of that, is we have the ability to project our own reputation, Right? Like we have the ability through social media to post the pictures that we want to curate our lives a bit, to project an image of who we want to be. And, and really, that has, has created as much good that social media has created, also creates a bit of negatives at times as well. Um, and so we live in this world where we are projecting this kind of reputation. I want to give you an example of this. In, uh, in 1990, so even before um, social media and all that, a man named Hugh Gallagher applied to. NYU University out in New York. And he responded with an essay to this question. The question, just like on any other college application was, are there any significant experiences you've had or accomplishments you have realized that have helped to define you as a person? A okay, pretty run-of-the-mill question. Well, here is his response. It's a little long, but I think it's worth it. He says this. He says, I am a dynamic figure, often seen scaling walls and crushing ice. I have been known to remodel train stations on my lunch breaks, making them more efficient in the area of heat retention. I translate ethnic slurs for Cuban refugees. I write award-winning operas. I manage time efficiently. And occasionally, I tread water for three days in a row. I woo women with my sensuous and godlike trombone playing. I can pilot bicycles up severe inclines with unflagging speed. And I cook 30-minute brownies in 20 minutes. <laughs> I am an expert in stecco, a veteran in love, and an outlaw in Peru. Using only a hoe and a large glass of water, I once single-handedly defended a small village in the Amazon basin from a horde of ferocious army ants. I play bluegrass cello. <laughs> I am the subject of numerous documentaries. When I'm bored, I build large suspension bridges in my yard. I enjoy urban hang gliding. On Wednesdays after school, I repair electrical appliances free of charge. I am an abstract artist, a concrete analyst, and a ruthless bookie. Critics worldwide swoon over my original line of corduroy evening wear. I don't perspire. <laughs> I am a private citizen, yet I receive fan mail. Last summer, I toured New Jersey with a traveling centrifugal force demonstration. My deft flower arrangements have earned me fame in international botany circles. Children trust me. <laughs> I can hurl tennis rackets at, at small moving objects with deadly accuracy. I once read Paradise Lost, Moby Dick, and David Copperfield in one day and still had time to refurbish an entire dining room that evening. I have performed several covert operations from the C for the CIA. I sleep once a week, and when I do sleep, I sleep in a chair. While on vacation in Canada, I once successfully negotiated with a group of terrorists who had seized a small bakery. The laws of physics do not apply to me. I balance, I weave, I dodge, I frolic, and my bills are all paid. On weekends, to let off steam, I participate in full contact origami. Years ago, I discovered the meaning of life but forgot to write it down. I have made extraordinary four-course meals using only a moolie and a toaster oven. I breed prize-winning clams. I have won bullfights in San Juan, cliff diving competitions in Sri Lanka, and spelling bees at the Kremlin. I have played Hamlet. I have performed open-heart surgery. I have spoken with Elvis, but I have not yet gone to college. 
<laughs> How fantastic is that? A true letter, a true submission to, uh, to NYU. He did get in and he did graduate in four short years. Um, but I love that, right? It's a great example because what he's doing is he is assuming that his reputation, right? And clearly it's doing it in, in, a, in a humorous way, but he's assuming that a reputation is what will achieve acceptance into the university. And I think, again, although he, um, I wish I could cook 30 minute brownies in 20 minutes. Um, we all can relate to this to some degree, right? That, that we project an image of what we want to be because we believe that that is how we will find acceptance or find the life that we are designing. And so for him, again, this is kind of the, the, the projection he is laying out. Um, and again, I love that because as we see in the church in Sardis, is a church who the reputation of who they have been has preceded them and they are living kind of off of that, right? They're living off this reputation that they had as a city and whatnot, as a church, all of that, but yet Jesus has a strong indictment against him. So um, let's jump into Revelation chapter three, verse one. It says, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, okay, as we've done each week, we pause and think, what is it about Sardis that may inform the rest of our reading? Well, Sardis um, was a part of these seven churches in an area known as Asia Minor, um, which was a part of the larger Roman Empire, which I talk about at length. And we see that it is in um, present-day Turkey, um, to give you kind of a reference point of where it's at. And it was at one point an influential and very important city. Um, when the Assyrian Empire had fallen, the Lydian Empire kind of came in behind it into power, and Sardis was the capital of the Lydian Empire. Uh, the king of the Lydian Empire actually lived in Sardis. Um, very wealthy, very prominent um, city. Had this reputation, again, of being a significant um, city. It was the first place that learned how to spin wool in the clothing and then learned how to dye it in the clothing. And so clothing was, was kind of what it was known for. Um, gold was discovered at Sardis. And uh, it was the first city to mint gold and silver coins. Um, so it was very much a city of influence, of innovation, um, of technological advancement. Um, it had a very prominent um, and economically and militarily powerful position. Um, it was known kind of as a city that could not be penetrated. Um, when they first built the city, they built it in two different levels. And the first one was built up on this mountainside. And, uh, and when the population had overgrown what they built there, they went down to the valley floor and built the second area um, where there was kind of like the common folk would live. And up above was where like the royalty and those of power um, would, would live as well. Well, on that upper part, um, it rested on three of its walls on this almost sheer cliff of 1,500 feet. Um, so that upper part was 1,500 feet above the valley floor. And on that top, they built walls on the edge of the cliff. And so you, you would imagine, I mean, you'd see it from a distance and it had that reputation that there is no way this city could be taken. Like it was impossible, an impregnable city um, because of kind of the way it was constructed, its economic power and its kind of military might. Uh, well, in the sixth century BC, um, the Persian Empire, the General Cyrus comes along and he kind of plants a couple soldiers to just watch the city and see if there's any way they could get it. It was a city that was, you know, people wanted to take it because of its kind of strategic positioning. And so they're sitting there and, and what happens as the story goes is there's these two soldiers that are standing on the wall kind of keeping watch and one of them, for whatever reason, their, his helmet falls off and falls all the way down to the valley floor. Well, wanting to recover it, he leaves the city and he walks down this trail and these Persian soldiers who had been camped out watching um, had seen and they had no idea that there was this hidden trail that this soldier just going to get his helmet had kind of revealed. So they watch him go down and then they, they see that and as they watch him go back up, they kind of follow behind him up into this city and that night they sneak in, they fling the gates open and the Persian army comes in and just ransacks the place. Um, to this unsurprising city that was the unpenetrable city, right? Well, that happens again 200 years later. After they rebuild a similar sort of story where they stumble across this kind of hidden road and the, and the whole city is taken, this unpenetrable city, right? It's just ransacked, right? And so, so this is kind of the life in Sardis, this once thriving kind of economic powerhouse, this political, um, powerful city is there. And so now um, we kind of read what Jesus says. So follow along in uh, verses one, one through two. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
It says again, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is, about to, and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. He looks at this church, and if we've been paying attention, every one of the letters begins with an affirmation. Right? Jesus, on every one of the letters thus far, has said, I see your works, your love, your perseverance, good job. Like it begins with this, but for Sardis, he looks at them and he says, listen, I know your works. You have this grand reputation that you, the laws of physics don't apply to you, right? You have this grand reputation. He says, but you are dead. He says, the story of your city is that you are alive and powerful and mighty and no one could ever take you, but you are dead. I mean, it is a scathing indictment. I mean, he comes with strong words against this church because what he's doing is he likens this church with the city's history, right? The city that was known for its ability to just kind of rest. And I mean, and the people of Sardis, they would, they would feel comfortable just kind of saying, yeah, no one could ever take us. But twice they're taken by surprise attack where they had no idea what was coming and they're just flattened. I mean, it was, Jesus looks and says, that story, the church in Sardis, the story of your city is the story of your church. You think you're alive, but you are dead. I mean, strong, strong words. It reminds me of Matthew 23 when Jesus is, is confronting the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious elites. And he goes in, it's like, imagine him rushing the Vatican and going before the Pope. I mean, that's kind of the picture of the scribes and Pharisees. I mean, they were the powerful, the elite. And Jesus rushes in and he says, woe to you, you hypocrites. He says, you're like whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. I mean, strong indictment. And he rushes to the church of Sardis and he says, listen, you think you're alive, but you are dead. Church, for some of us, this is where we kind of find ourselves. We find ourselves with, with this reputation of being alive, that, that our story is we've been in church for decades. We've been in this pews. I mean, I grew up in the church. My mom was a children's pastor. During the summers, I spent more time at church than I spent at home. And right, that's not even like hyperbole. I really did. Like I knew the games. I knew how to appear alive and yet inside be full of dead man's bones. I mean, I knew the, the, the way to project a reputation. I mean, the, the, the temptation for anyone on stage with a microphone is to project the reputation of being alive and yet remain dead. I mean, I get this, right? Like we would pull up at church and the whole world was on fire and we're screaming and yelling at each other. But then we get out and it's like, oh, how are you? I'm fine. Things are good. Right? Like, we know this. It, I mean, we, if we're good at anything in church, it's this. It's playing the games. I mean, we are great at it. And Jesus says, listen, when I get up close, I see you have this reputation of being alive. He says, but you're really dead. You're really dead. Because the pull for all of us is the more familiar we get with the way of Jesus, the more unfamiliar we become with its subversive nature. That the more we, we get used to it, the more we hear the stories, the more we think we have all the right answers, everything lined up, the more familiar we get. Um, Dallas Willard would say it actually breeds unfamiliarity. Um, he says this in his book, speaking of the one who's grown familiar uh, of the story, he says in his case, quite frankly, presumed familiarity has led to unfamiliarity and unfamiliarity has led to contempt and contempt has led to profound ignorance. So it's the challenge for us is that we come week in and week out hearing the stories, going through the motions, resting on some reputation that we've built. And Jesus says, listen, you're dead. You're dead. I mean, he says, why are you wasting your time? He says, you're, I'm either Lord or I'm not. Um, Tim Keller, a pastor in New York, I heard him once say that, that with Jesus, you either crown him Lord or you crucify him. He says, but the response of apathy just makes no sense. Right, to look at Jesus, the one who comes and he proclaims to be the son of God, to be the Messiah, to bring deliverance to the oppressed, to bring hope to the lonely, to the poor, to the hungry, all of that. He says he's come to do that, made these radical statements, and to respond in apathy doesn't make sense. He says that to respond like the Romans did and be upset and want to crucify him, he says that actually makes more sense than apathy. He says, that makes, that makes sense because Jesus came and he flipped the world upside down. But to respond with just this sleepy kind of hollow religiosity, 
He says, that doesn't make any sense. You either, you either claim him as Lord, which is a title, okay, which means that you come under him, that he now has reign over your whole life. Every decision is now subject to Lord. Right? He says, you either crown him as Lord or you crucify him. He says, those are really the only two responses. But church, again, the pull for all of us is towards complacency. It is towards being apathetic to the way of Jesus. This subversive nature where Jesus turns everything upside down. He says that is this, this kingdom of God that he inaugurates, that he brings. He says we grow callous and blind to that if we're not careful. And church, I think for us, again, that's our challenge. That's our challenge. Well, he goes on. He says in verse 3, he says, again, I know your works. You have this reputation of being alive, but you are dead. He says, I found your works not complete in the sight of my God. In verse 3, remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. He says, remember, right? This is all through the scriptures. We see God continually going to the nation of Israel and saying, remember, remember, remember. Look back at the story. Remember what I've done. Remember what I did in Exodus. Remember what I did through the Old Testament. Remember who I am, that you are my people. He says, remember, remember. He says, and then look at what you've received and heard. He's speaking of the apostles' teachings. When the apostles went to Sardis, they planted this church. He says, remember what they said. He says, look back at the gospel, the thing that first captured your imagination. He says, come back to that. He says, church, remember who Jesus was. Remember what he did. Remember the way he inaugurated a new way of living, an alternative community, an alternative society. He says, look back, remember that. And then he says, keep it and repent. Or your Bible might say, obey and repent. And he connects the idea of repentance with works. Right? And works, again, is the super dirty word in church, and it shouldn't be, right? It's, it's, yes, we're saved by grace. Let's move on and let's understand that, but now let's go forward. He says, repent and obey. Right? And what we tend to do with this idea of repentance is we like to over-spiritualize it, and we make it this big emotional kind of thing, which it should. There, it's not to discredit that. That is a piece of it. But repentance at its core is this idea of reframing the way you see the world, of, of even more literally churning around, of going a radically different direction. And that would entail every bit of who we are. So he says, remember the way of Jesus. Remember what he called you to. And then he says again, he says, keep it. Obey and repent. He says, churn the other way. Think of the world that changed the way you view money, the way you view relationships, the way you view your job, the way you eat, the way you do everything in your life. It comes subject under the lordship of Christ, and we live in a completely different way. And notice, right, in this letter, there is no enemy like we've seen in the past, right? In the past enemies, or in letters, we saw Jezebel, we saw uh, the Nicolaitans, we saw the, the Roman oppression, but the only enemy in Sardis is the church of Sardis. It is themselves, it is this apathy. He says, you are relying on this, this old reputation that your apathy is creating this sort of death in you. That the only way that, that you are hindered from the way of the kingdom of God is your own apathy getting in its way. He says, wake up. Wake up. He says, just like those soldiers who, who were unsuspecting, who just went down to get their home and didn't think anything of it because all the city was just like there resting on its laurels and it was taken and ransacked. He says, so is your church. He says, wake up. Wake up. Stop playing the games. He says, There's, you know, if, you're, if you're just going to go through the motions, he says, what's the point? He says, wake up. Repent. Keep it and repent. And he says, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And I will not let you know at what hour I will come against you, just like you have been taken twice by, by surprise attacks. So I will come like a thief in the night, unsuspecting. You won't have any idea what's coming. And he says, and, and, and the church will be demolished. He says, wake up, wake up, return to the gospel. Right? And then he goes on, he offers a bit of hope, though. He offers this, this kind of perspective where we see that not all in Sardis had, had succumbed to that kind of apathy. In verse 4. It says, yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will, work with, or they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay, remember, Sardis is known for its clothing. 
And so Jesus is drawing this image of, of this cornerstone in their kind of economic life. And he's saying, there are some among you who have not soiled their garments. Okay, this idea of soiling your garments. Um, in the first century world, you would not be able to approach the gods um, if your garments were soiled, if they were dirty. You have to go, you'd have to clean up, whatever, before you approach God. And Jesus says, listen, there are some in Sardis. There is a faithful remnant, a few who have remained strong, that haven't given in to apathy, that led to this culture being and shaping and forming them. He says, those few who haven't soiled their garments, they're walking with me in white. Right? White meaning this purity, this set-apartness. This, um, this is why brides wear white on their wedding day. Right? It's this, they're set apart. They're distinct. It also has this connotation of victory. That a general, after um, you know, winning a war, would throw on a white robe and would kind of walk around. It's this picture of, of distinction, honor, and victory. And Jesus says, that remnant, that few who stayed strong, who didn't soil their garments, says they're walking with me in victory. He says, look to them. They are your example of a church that's staying awake, that hasn't fallen asleep, that hasn't slipped into apathy. He says, those few are there and they are worthy. Who we remember the kingdom of God, this, this new way of seeing the world. Well, he goes on and he offers an invitation, essentially saying that not all is dead yet. And he offers this invitation um, or really this kind of threefold promise in, in verses five and six. And he says this, he says, to the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Okay, he offers three promises to the one who can conquer that. To the ones whose garments are soiled. He says, if you overcome that, if you wake up, he says, I will clothe you in white garments. He says, the same ones that that few have, he says, you, will, you can share in that victory, you can share in that purity, that anything can be washed white as snow, as the scriptures say. He says, all of that, if you overcome that, he says, I will dress you in white garments. Then he has this other one. He says, and I will, I will never blot your name out of the book of life. Okay? In, in a Roman world, um, most of the cities would have these registries where they would have the name of every citizen written in a book. And when they died, they would erase the name to kind of keep the records pure. Well, they would also erase names if crimes, if certain crimes were committed, um, or if a crime demanded um, that you were executed, they would erase your name before executing you so that it didn't look like the Roman Empire was killing off their own. And so these, these kind of book of life, and Sardis had one of these kind of registries. And Jesus says, listen, just like your name is in there, he says, I will write your name in the book of life, in the kingdom of God. And he says, I will never blot it out. There's no crime there's nothing, there's not, death itself cannot separate you from me. Reminder of Romans 8, right, 38, where Paul says, nothing will separate us from the love of God, neither height nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities. Right? All, he goes on this litany of things that we think separate us, but he says, if the trajectory of your heart is towards the thing of God, things of God, yes, we make a mess of it. Yes, we need grace and forgiveness. But he says, if your, your heart is on that trajectory, he says, I will never blot your name out. I mean, for the church in Sardis to stand faithful would have put them at odds with the Roman Empire, which would have been a crime of insurrection, right? And he says, if that's you, if you remain faithful, if you stay awake, if you don't allow the culture to, to push you around and shape you, he says, you will be put in the book of life and I'll never blot it out. I mean, what a promise, right? And then he goes on one more and he says, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. It's essentially this, you will stand before God and I will affirm your citizenship in heaven. I will stand, I'll say, yes, that guy there, he is a part of the kingdom. That woman stayed strong. It says, they are there, they will, I will confess my name before you. Jesus looks at this church that had succumbed to this kind of apathy that allowed this sleepy kind of hollow religiosity to take up. And he says, wake up. You think you're alive, but you're dead. I mean, church, all of us have those blind spots, right? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave this God I love, as the old hymn says. I mean, the pull of our heart it's towards apathy, complacency, to thinking we have the answers. But Jesus says, wake up. Remember this subversive message of the gospel. This good news that flipped the world upside down. 
that was bringing up evil to all these, these, these firm establishments. He says that remember that, wake up. And church, all of us, again, we need to, as Christians, we ask the penetrating question to say, is there anything in my life that I've grown apathetic in? Is there a way where I'm allowing the world to be shaped or shaping me in ways that are contrary to the kingdom of God? Is there ways I'm, I've allowed this kind of slip to say, no, this is, this is fine if I just accept a bit of this. And Jesus is saying, listen, wake up, strengthen what remains. He says, that little bit of life, tap into that, bring that, revive that back to life. In Mark chapter 11, uh, Mark and, and Jesus, they kind of do a pretty creative thing on the way that they um, tell this story. And in Mark 11, um, we see Jesus right after the uh, triumphal entry. And he's come into the city the first day of the last week of his life. And he enters into the city. And what we see in verse 11 of chapter 11 is it says this. It says, and he entered Jerusalem, he being Jesus, and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Okay, so he enters the city, he goes into the temple. And what he would have seen at that point is when you enter the temple, there was this outer court. And the outer court would have had um, Jews and pagans, okay? And again, pagans, we kind of think of it as like, oh, the dirty pagans. Pagan is just a non-Jew, okay? So understand, it's not some sort of kind of dig. Um, but it's the Jews and the pagans were in this outer court. And what you would have seen there was this kind of bustling area. I mean, it would have been very active. You would have saw um, people buying and selling sacrifices. Um, the best way to describe it is think of like our trading floors. Like think of Wall Street, but then add livestock, all right? That's kind of what you would see, all right? So a bit of chaos, a bit of just lots of activity. And so Jesus enters into the temple. He sees it. It would look alive. It would look like things were, were going and were in motion. And he enters the temple. He sees all of that. But then it says he's, it's late. So he left with his disciples. Okay, so he leaves with his disciples. And this is what happens in verse 12. It says, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he, again being Jesus, was hungry. And seeing in a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So what we have here is Jesus being like ultra hangry, all right? Um, super angry, super hungry. Like this has always been one of this weird like, why do we see Jesus cursing a tree all of a sudden, right? Well, he's, remember, this whole piece was constructed together. He comes out of the temple. He's walking with his disciples, and he goes up to this tree. And what's really confusing about it is he curses it for not bearing fruit, but yet it wasn't fig season, which is like... What is going on? Well, what I learned this week is that fig trees in kind of in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East or in the Near East, um, in a first century world, would produce actually two fruits. Okay, they would produce a fruit when it was in leaf, as the scripture says. It would pr produce these little tiny fruits that were um, very acidic and they weren't really tasty. But what it would do is it would indicate that the tree is healthy and will bear fruit in its time. And so Jesus comes to this tree, and, and one of the common practices is that travelers would eat those little tiny um, fruits because it was a good source of kind of sustenance. And so Jesus, coming out of the temple, he walks by this tree. He's a bit hungry. He goes and looks. He sees it's in leaf. It looks like it's alive. And yet when he gets close, he doesn't see the tiny fruit that indicates that the, the tree is either diseased or is dying. This tree that looks like it's alive. From a distance, he looks. It's all these leaves, everything. It looks alive, but he gets close, and the tree is dead. And he says, will no one ever eat fruit from you again? Right? And the disciples are all sorts of confused, right? Well, here, let's listen as the story goes on. Verse 15. It says, and they came to Jerusalem. Again, in the same kind of timeline, all right? This isn't something different, but in verse 15. It says, and they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when the evening came, they went out of the city." Jesus, after visiting the temple once, seeing it alive, uses this fig tree as an object lesson for his disciples. He says, it looks alive, but it's dead. 
He took his disciples to the church, to the temple, and he says, it looks alive. And the next day he begins to just flip the tables upside down saying, it's a den of robbers. See, Jesus, for some of us, needs to rush into our hearts and flip the tables because we look alive, but we're dead. He says, it looks like this is supposed to be this house of prayer, this house of love. He says, but he walked in, he says, it's a den of robbers, and he flips the tables upside down and drives out the livestock. Church, for some of us, this is the message for us this morning. For Sardis, that was the message. That complacency and apathy had taken place of this life and life abundant that Jesus offers. That's subversive and difficult and challenging. It'll cost you everything, but at the same time, you will gain everything. He says he rushes into the temple and he flips the tables upside down. And listen to the way the story closes in verse 20. So as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered, remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. See, afterwards, they leave again the temple after Jesus had just flipped the whole thing upside down and his disciples walk by the tree and they get it. You see, that tree is dead. It once looked alive, but it's dead. Church, notice that when Jesus runs into the temple, he doesn't drive out the pagans or the unholy ones, right, that they would believe. He drove out and confronts the church because the church wasn't doing what it was to, supposed to do. The church was, was living on this reputation. It had churned it into something for its own gain, for its own prosperity. It had grown kind of apathetic to the way of the kingdom and the way of God. And as the story says it withered and died, just like the fig tree. Church, for some of us this morning, again, we need to have that conversation with Jesus. We need to ask the hard questions. We need to get honest with ourselves and say, is there anything in me that I've grown apathetic to the way of Jesus? I've allowed other things to come. Is there any way I've fallen asleep? And Jesus says, wake up, wake up. Strengthen what remains. He says, find those few who haven't soiled their garments. Find those few who are still alive. He says, find them, look to them. He says, but wake up because you're dying. This apathy is just, it's not the response that makes sense. And Jesus says, listen, stop playing the game. Stop exchanging the kingdom of God for wealth and comfort and security because that's what Sardis had done. They had rested in the wealth and security and all that the city offered. They'd rested in that and forgot that their identity was as a distinct community among the, 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 the dominant culture. And he says, wake up, strengthen what remains. He says, that is your call. So again, church, for some of us, as we prepare for communion, we need to come to this old ritual as we do every week. And we need to take the cup and the juice and we need to ask of ourselves, have I grown, or have I grown apathetic? Have I fallen asleep? Jesus, reveal the ways my heart has been given over to complacency. For some of us, we need that. For some of us, we need it as a reminder this morning to say that God is moving, he is active, that the story isn't over. It's the reminder in the, in the bread and the juice and his body and his blood that he is working to create and establish that kingdom and he's inviting us on the way. For some of us, we take communion and we need that encouragement to say, Jesus, thank you for being here and being awake. And for some of us, we need to take that. So church, may we grab a hold, maybe in, with fresh eyes, of this gospel that turned the world around. May we allow Jesus, and even inviting him in to say, flip the tables of my heart so that I can see you afresh and see you new. I mean, church, this is our call. This is communion. So as we take, may we take with that perspective, not allowing it to just be an old dusty ritual, but bring it to life, revive it to life. This message, this story that he is moving and changing the world. And he's saying, come along with me. He says, wake up, strengthen what remains. Come along with me. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God, as we come to communion, Lord, as we um, think about the city of Sardis, Lord, the church in Sardis, God, I think so many of us have fallen asleep. God, the pull of our heart is towards complacency, and God, we need to be woken up. So Lord, in these next few minutes, as we take the bread, as we take the juice, Lord, may you wake our souls up. Will you remind us of the story? Lord, may we be honest and bold 
to question, to doubt, to, to see the ways that maybe that we've gone, um, we've gotten too comfortable, too familiar um, with you, with the story, Lord. May, may you, again, spend these few moments shaping our souls more and more into followers of Jesus. And so God, would you help us with that this morning? We give you, um, Lord, this space to move, to work. Um, God, open our eyes, open our hearts to the ways that we need you to move and work. So God, in these next few moments, use these in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.